Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world, and so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm so thrilled you've joined me tonight for another fabulous story, because as I always say, nothing in this world beats a good story. It's just something that's a feel-good factor in our lives that so easily can be overlooked, but without a story, life is never nearly as good. And let's get started with our story. Dear Sarah and all you lovely listeners, my name is Matthew and I'm from Seattle in Washington and my remarkable, incredulous story began shortly after my great-uncle Huck passed away of a heart attack. This was on his small cattle ranch, east of the Cascades in Washington. It would appear that he had left his sizable estate to my father in his will, which included his small cattle ranch. This all happened in 2011, when I was about 11 years old at the time. This prodigious gesture of extravagant generosity on my great-uncle's part surprised my dad, as he had never expressed an interest in raising cattle before, and he'd only ever visited the ranch a handful of times as a young boy to play with his cousin Donovan. Very sadly, Donovan's mother had died of bowel cancer when he was only eight years old, and so Donovan grew up to be his father's blue-eyed boy. Unfortunately, Donovan, my great-uncle's only son, should have inherited the cattle ranch from his dad, but had tragically been killed in a horse-riding accident five years prior when he went flying off a horse and crashing and colliding onto a rocky ridge. After his tragic death, as you can imagine, my great-uncle was never really the same again, because a deep depression hung over his life like an oppressive dark thundercloud. He sought solace and comfort from the lonely emptiness he regularly experienced by talking to his cows, because they never answered him back, and he always felt in some bizarre way that they almost commiserated with him over the compounding grief that he suffered in his life. According to a good friend of Huck's, he really believed that his cows understood him. So it was that my family made the decision to move to the ranch for the summer holidays that was to decide what was to be done about the place, as selling up seemed almost unthinkable, given how much blood, sweat and tears that my great-uncle had invested in the place over the years. I remember that momentous, memorable day as if it was yesterday. That was the day that I first laid eyes on this heavenly ranch, and it was just so breathtakingly beautiful to behold. I couldn't believe it. There were open pastures for rotational feeding, and there were mountainous valleys, rugged outcrops, and pretty little country roads. There was a sparkling silvery lake that was flanked by a dreamy statuesque forest of mature imposing trees that had been superbly preserved by my great-uncle. It was so incredible that this outstanding impressive property was all ours, and my shaggy golden retriever sensed that. Lassie was literally over the moon, about this brand new, exciting adventure of ours. I laughed as I watched her darting everywhere, smelling every available piece of turf, and lifting her leg on everything that she could possibly mark. It was as if she was saying, Watch out, I'm in Eastern Washington, and get used to it, because I'm making my presence known, and I'm marking my new auspicious territory. Lassie also adored swimming in the lake, while I would throw sticks for her to catch and I could tell that if Lassie had her way, she would gladly make the cattle ranch her brand new home. And much to my amazement, she had even managed to befriend the cows. The grand ranch-style home with its grey roof and whitewashed walls was exceedingly attractive and in a very good state of repair. It was a quintessential two-storey home, with all the bedrooms situated upstairs and the first floor devoted to open-plan living, where the kitchen seamlessly blended into the living and dining quarters of the home without any restrictive partitions, which meant that the whole dwelling was both sumptuous, cosy, spacious, airy and light. There were gorgeous large stone fireplaces in the living area, comfortable family-sized couches scattered with pretty colourful cushions, glass coffee tables layered with interesting-looking books, and a very large oak dresser superbly displayed with blue and white Royal Dalton china plates and accessories, giving the whole space a shabby chic kind of look. There were large stylish windows along the front of the house as well as seamless glass sliding doors that pulled back to reveal a generously sized covered patio area that overlooked magnificent panoramic views over the evergreen trees that flanked the sparkling jewel-like lake. It would seem that no expense had been spared, 
on kitting out the patio with state-of-the-art barbecue equipment, not to mention a fridge and a bar, and even a pizza oven, if that wasn't enough. It's so beautiful, gasped my mother. I'd love to live here permanently. Not so fast, honey, said my father, kissing her on the cheek. I don't know the first thing about running a ranch, and frankly I'm not sure if I'm cut out for the job. It looks dauntingly overwhelming for me. Don't be so hard on yourself, dear, said my mother. You can turn your hand to anything and make it work. I know you could. At that moment there was a knock at the door, and standing in the doorway was a rather stylish-looking older gentleman. He was wearing a cowboy hat and boots, along with a pair of Levi jeans, with a zooty leather belt, adorned with an oversized, rather ornate-looking buckle that was embossed with an engraving of a large bull upon it. He was wearing a stylish, rather debonair white cotton shirt, with the sleeves rolled up to the elbows. In my opinion, he bore a striking, uncanny resemblance to Clint Eastwood, with the whole cowboy look going on. The slender, athletic, strong body, the rugged, weathered complexion, and the white hair. Howdy there, he said. I'm Abel, and I was Huck's farmhand. I'm dreadfully sorry for your loss, he said, reaching out to shake all of our hands. So lovely to meet you, my mother interjected. We're going to need all your help running this ranch. We've not got the first clue how to get started. That's what I'm here for, he said. I know all of the ropes, so I'll teach you everything you need to know about the cows. Must have been a big shock for you, inheriting the ranch out of the blue like this, with all the cows, chickens and horses to boot. It's tough for city folks to get the hang of the country, but you'll learn quickly enough. That's a promise. Oh, believe me, I'm going to need all the help I can get, said my father. I'm still trying to get my head around it all. Luckily he didn't suffer, said Abel, as he began to talk about my great-uncle. He was out there feeding the cows, and then I saw him fall over, and he was a goner, just like that. Died the way he wanted to go, with his beloved cows. He loved those animals like they were his children, you know. Well, that's a good thing, said my mother. I mean that he died so peacefully. He knew he was going to die, said Huck reflectively. I thought he was talking baloney at the time, when he told me to look after this place and his cows for him, when he was gone. Naturally, I asked him what the heck he was on about, because he was so healthy at the time. He said he'd seen a vision of his son Donovan in a dream, you know. His son was riding on horseback under the sun, towards the rocky ridge where he actually had that terrible accident. And he said, Dad, I'm coming to get you soon, and then cantered away on his horse. He believed the dream because he said it was that vivid. Not like other dreams, he told me. Wow, said my father, that's extraordinary. It's almost like a premonition. You could say that, said Abel. There were a few strange things happening around here over the years, but that's a whole other story. I do need to inform you, though, that we have been having a few problems with wolves trying to attack cows in the area although, fingers crossed, it hasn't happened here on our ranch yet. From what I gather, fish and game are not much of a help either, as they seem much more intent with saving the wolves and not our cows, which is a hell of a shame if you ask me. I mean, the cows are our livelihoods around here. What are you going to do about it? asked my father in horror. Well, I keep the cows enclosed in the rotational pasture land for their own protection, so they're not free to wander as they please. The problem is that the pole fences won't stop the wolves from getting into the cows, but at least they're contained, so we can be alerted if they're attacked. Some of the big ranches in the area have lost cows to these sporadic wolf attacks, and they've been getting worse lately. It seems that the wolves aren't even scared of the humans, so it's an increasing worry for all the ranch owners out here. Anyway, I'll leave you to get settled in, he said, lifting his cowboy hat off his head very briefly in a gesture of friendliness and walking away. "'Wolves,' said my father. "'Who would have thought they'd be a problem on a cattle ranch? "'I hope they stay away from here, "'because I'm not sure I could handle fighting off creatures like that on a ranch. "'Maybe they're breeding too much,' I suggested, "'especially if they're being protected. "'Good point, son,' said my father. "'Too much of anything causes problems, "'like too many hogs cause environmental damage. "'And even though I like wolves, "'it seems they're getting out of hand in the area.' and I hope fish and game do something about it, and just don't sit on their laurels and do nothing. Before long, my family settled down and adapted to ranch life quite happily, and we really began to enjoy our whole new experience. 
of living here on the ranch. I was helping my dad with the cattle, and I really warmed to the creatures, because believe it or not, cows are really rather nice. I even caught my father talking to them once, so I think he was beginning to appreciate the great outdoors, but was very reluctant to admit it. I had also been riding with Abel over the ravishing beautiful countryside, and he had been teaching me all the ropes on how to run a cattle ranch smoothly. I would spend ages with Abel riding on the back of my horse, feeling its hooves trotting along the country lanes or the grassy turf beneath me, and enjoying the feeling of the gentle breeze blowing against my face, as well as taking in all these gorgeous panoramic views of the countryside like a delicious sweet nectar. The gallulous Abel told me so many stories about my great uncle that were so fascinating that I hung on to his every word. As we were trotting along a country road with Lassie my golden retriever tottering behind us with her bushy tail wagging profusely, Abel began to tell me the most extraordinary story that I'd ever heard. One time, he continued, we found two dead bodies over there in the woods, he said pointing to the wooded area that flanked the pristine-looking silvery lake that gleamed in the mid-morning sun and reflected the trees and fluffy clouds on its surfaces like a mirror. What? I gasped. Human bodies? They were human, all right, clearly trespassing on our land, but the bodies had been killed, mutilated and mauled in a very despicable fashion. When did this happen? I asked. Oh, that was about thirty good years ago, he said. How were they killed? Well, their heads had been brutally and violently twisted off their necks, much like a chicken head, and the eyes had been removed from the hollowed sockets, and the arms had been literally ripped off the bodies. Let me assure you, it was the most ghastly, grisly, catastrophic and most gruesome sight that I have ever witnessed in my entire life. It was horrifying, he said. It would have taken something monstrously big to tear off a human limb like that, much like you or I tearing off a cooked piece of turkey breast away from the carcass. It was like that. But who could have done such a heinous, appalling thing, I asked. Well, your uncle was convinced it was a Bigfoot although at the time no one knew what a Bigfoot was, so Huck kept his mouth firmly sealed, because he knew people would think he was absolutely loopy if he suggested a hairy humanoid ape was responsible for the erroneous, bizarre deaths. You see, Abel continued, the authorities believed it was a bear attack. Now I assure you, a bear doesn't kill a human being like that, and they know it. The only thing it could have been was a Bigfoot. It couldn't have been anything else. A Bigfoot, I asked, looking dumbfounded. But are those things even real? Oh, they're real, all right, snapped Abel. Your uncle saw one in those woods over there, shortly before the harrowing, deadly incident occurred. I believed him. Your uncle never told a pork pie a day in his life, let me tell you. I remember it was on a Sunday morning when your great uncle took his German long-haired pointers, Biscuit and Poppy, for a lazy ramble in the woods. He said his dog suddenly became incredibly enthused, excited and energised and began to bark continually at something that your uncle couldn't actually see. Whatever they were barking at was something that was very pleasing to them. Then your great-uncle suddenly saw a movement in his peripheral vision that looked like a shadowy form in the undergrowth. Once the creature knew it had been seen, it rose from its crouch position and stood up on its two powerful long legs, shielding half of his Herculean-sized body behind a tree trunk, with one overlong arm wrapped around it. Huck said the creature just stared at him with those bright golden eyes, and he said he was so unsettled because it was as if the creature was literally looking through his soul. He said that his heart began to pound violently in his chest like a heavy drum, and it was so thunderously hard he could actually hear it. He said he was so paralysed by fear because this thing was colossal, and was covered in shaggy dark brown hair. At the time, your great-uncle did not know what on earth it was, and described it as a giant humanoid ape. Was it aggressive towards him, I asked? No, not at all. That's the absurd thing, said Ape. The critter seemed gentle and rather curious, and even his German pointers seemed unusually gregarious and good-natured towards the critter, which was the most peculiar thing of all. It was as if they were familiar and well acquainted with the beast. Biscuit literally bounded over to the hairy critter and jumped up and down on him like he was welcoming an old friend, and the critter patted the dog affectionately, almost as if he knew him well. 
Now those dogs slept outside watching the cows at night, so maybe they had met the curious critter before. Your uncle reprimanded Biscuit severely and told him to get back here. Those dogs were incredibly obedient and loved the bones of your great uncle, but they seemed reluctant and hesitant to say goodbye to their hairy friend, whom let's just say they appeared to really like. Your uncle ran as fast as he possibly could back to the house because he was so terrified. He told me it was the toughest, most gruelling and challenging run of his entire life because his legs failed to cooperate and felt like blocks of cement beneath him. I remember him telling me that his adrenaline that had been coursing through his veins had been of no use whatsoever to him in increasing his speed because his running had been laborious and laboured almost as if he was treading water. He was so scared he looked as white as a ghost and his eyes were as wide as saucers and he said, Abel, I've just seen a colossal monster in the woods and can you believe it? My dogs actually liked the thing. Well, I asked if the creature was as gentle as you say, why did Great Uncle Huck believe the Bigfoot murdered those people in such a barbaric way? Huck was certain no one else could have perpetrated that grisly crime. It was the way they were killed, you see. Who else could have possibly killed those people like that? Who has the strength to twist a human neck like a chicken? Did they ever find out the identities of those trespassers that were killed, I asked curiously. Well, yes, that was where the story gets interesting, because the authorities discovered that many missing cows had mysteriously vanished in the area, had actually been stolen by these two men. So your great uncle was convinced those men were scouting his ranch, with nefarious motives, with the full intention of stealing a few cows. It would make sense because they were carrying rifles and binoculars at the time, including a notebook that contained timetables of detailing the movements on our farm. After that startling revelation, Huck felt a lot less sympathetic towards the two dead men who had lost their lives so treacherously and in such a gruesome way. You see, those cows were his life, so you don't mess with a rancher's cows. Ask any rancher about that. They take it very personally, you know. Could the Bigfoot have possibly been protecting the cows, I suggested? Maybe he sensed that the men were up to no good. Your Uncle Huck came to the very same conclusion and began to believe that the Bigfoot was territorial and protective towards the ranch and its animals. So actually he warmed to the Bigfoot but never saw it again because they are very elusive creatures by nature. That's why they're not rarely documented by science. Wow, I said, that's some story. Little was I to realise at the time that I would have a story all of my own to tell that was also extraordinary. It all happened when my golden retriever Lassie that sleeps at my feet began to growl furiously at the end of my bed one night. I noticed that her ears were pinned right back and her tail was thumping and hanging between her legs. I immediately knew something was very wrong and the first thing I thought about was the safety of the cattle and so I quickly grabbed my dad's hunting rifle and raced out of the front door as fast as I could towards the pasture where the cows were grazing. Sure enough, I could see that the cattle were terribly flustered. They were mooing earnestly and there were several grey wolves stealthily moving in on one of the smaller cows as they hankered beneath the polled fencing and crept cautiously closer and closer to their intended victim. To my absolute horror, Lassie bounded towards the wolves and started barking at them fearlessly. But she was outnumbered by these creatures, and then they circulated her and began to growl, and one leapt forward and lunged over my dog, pinning her onto the ground. That was my worst nightmare, unravelling before my very eyes. I was about to lose my precious dog. Everything seemed to be happening in slow motion, and every second seemed to last a lifetime, my heart was pounding violently in my chest and my fingers were clumsily trying to straighten my rifle to aim at the wolf. But I was so terrified of shooting my dog by mistake. Suddenly I saw him emerging out of the shadows and to my amazement it was a big foot. I could hardly believe it. I was so stunned. This creature was as fast as grease lightning and he came to my dog's rescue in a miraculous second. I promise you his movements were so swift that an unloaded bullet from a rifle would fail to compete. He bounded towards the wolf's wolf and his mouth curled back to reveal a large set of human teeth and he unleashed the most horrifying roar that was so thunderous and so terrifying it caused the ground to shake and wobble beneath me. 
my whole body literally trembled with terror. In a trice, this creature had lifted the wolf that was on top of Lassie and tossed it into the air like a frisbee, where it landed on the ground with a heavy thump. He twisted its neck so violently that the head was turned to face the opposite direction, which looked seriously macabre. I promise you, this wolf looked like a tiny puppy in this gargantuan hands of the monstrous beast. The wolves were so petrified, they started to make whimpering sounds as they retreated backwards, watching their friend succumbing to its deadly fate. This Bigfoot grabbed another wolf and killed it with the same violent momentum and deadly sequence, and the rest of the wolf pack fled away in absolute terror, making some strange whimpering sounds, with their hair on their coats quite literally doubling in size, much like a cat's does when it's frightened. It was extraordinary. Lassie came bounding towards me, so delighted to have been rescued, because she knew her life had been spared. I couldn't believe that she barely had a scratch on her. I knew if the Bigfoot hadn't reacted so swiftly, Lassie would most certainly have been dead. Once the wolves had gone, the Bigfoot looked at me for a moment, and his golden eyes seemed both congenial and very warm. I nodded to the Bigfoot and said thank you, and I know this sounds weird, but I'm certain he understood me. I noticed the Bigfoot possessed the typical cone-shaped head that is so often described, and it seamlessly blended into his shoulders without any evidence of a neck. It was covered in long, shaggy grey hair, with areas of white, and his leathery skin on its over-warm-like face was very weathered and shriveled, and also quite wrinkled, and I really got the impression that this wizened creature was quite long in the tooth. To my amazement, Lassie assuredly went bounding up to the hairy creature, as she knew that it had indeed saved her life, and her gratitude was immense. The large hand of the Bigfoot cradled her head and gently stroked her body. I noticed that the critter was missing two fingers on one of his hands. I watched in astonishment as Lassie rubbed her body against the creature's strong, powerful legs very affectionately, as if she was almost laying claim to him. I want to stress that Lassie is a devoted, doting and tender-hearted dog, but she can be wary and reticent of strangers, and is only friendly to those she trusts. It's rare for her to display such warmth to a complete stranger, so I was flabbergasted and rather astonished. I would say that this Bigfoot was easily nine foot tall, eight hundred pounds and three foot wide, and was clearly built for power, speed and strength. Put it this way, he was intimidating and scary, but his powerful demeanour contradicted his foreboding appearance, and although he killed those wolves in such a savagely brutal way, in reality he was really a rather gentle giant, who was seemingly rather protective to both my dog and the cows, which was so commendable. I mean, who wouldn't want that? I noticed that while all this was transpiring, some rather interested, curious cows were watching everything that was occurring with wide, curious eyes and a very eager interest. They didn't seem afraid of the Bigfoot for some strange reason, which rather suggested to me that this was not their first encounter with the hairy humanoid, and that they weren't uncomfortable with his appearance at all. At this point I'd like to mention that I never smelt that hot garbage smell that is often associated with a Bigfoot sighting. For me the creature smelt a little like my wet dog, but that never offends me. Suddenly I heard my father walking towards the front door, and in that instant the Bigfoot threw both wolves, one over each shoulder, much like a big dangling furry scarf, and gracefully glided away at lightning speed, clearly not wanting to be observed by my father. "'What's going on?' asked my dad. "'I'm sure I heard some noises. Are the cows all right? It's not the wolves, is it?' he asked, looking apprehensive. He was half asleep, wearing his dressing gown and slippers, and looked very tired. "'Why was Lassie barking so much?' he continued and making such a raucous commotion. Everything's fine, I assured him. I knew if I told my dad what had actually happened, he would have overreacted and might have chosen to sell my great-uncle's ranch, claiming that dealing with a Bigfoot and a bunch of wolves was far more than he could ever handle. I didn't want him to have the perfect excuse to concede defeat. My father was often quick to doubt himself, even though he was a man of many talents and accomplishments. My mother was always the one to make him see sense, and give him a nudge in the right direction. I was enjoying living here so much on the cattle ranch. I was not going to tell him anything, because I had a vested interest in staying here. I also felt so connected with the cows and the land. 
I had developed a deep longing in my heart to become a rancher one day, as this intriguing, idyllic, inspirational, wholesome lifestyle seemed as natural as breathing to me. The last thing I wanted was to return to our humdrum, monotonous and seemingly dreary lives back in the city. Even my studious mother was loving life on the ranch, and my father just needed a little more persuading to convince him to jack in his tediously boring job in the city as a chartered accountant to become a fully-fledged cattle rancher. You see, I was exceedingly confident knowing that that remarkable, protective and rather loyal Bigfoot was ensuring that both the cows and my dog Lassie were indeed in safe hands. I was to find out that I was very right, because many ranchers in the Washington area had ongoing wolf attacks on their cows, but it would seem the wolves have left ours alone, thanks to the Bigfoot that was always on patrol. When I confided in Abel about what had transpired that night, and how Bigfoot had miraculously rescued Lassie from the wolf attack, I mentioned that the hairy ape-like humanoid that I encountered was actually missing two digits on one of his hands. Imagine the surprise I got when Abel informed me that he had failed to mention that the Bigfoot my great-uncle Huck had observed was also missing two digits on his hands. So the Bigfoot had clearly lived on this land for over thirty years and had grown accustomed to the daily routines of ranch life. It would seem that the Bigfoot has succumbed to the ravages of age and the environmental hazards of a hard lifestyle, for over the years his dark brown hair has receded and grown grey. It would seem that this extraordinary critter really loves dogs and even cows that he watches over, and he succeeded in protecting them all. I ask you, what better guard could you possibly have? I've heard rather terrible stories about Bigfoots before, such as you cannot trust them and that they're exceedingly dangerous. I can't make any comments about other people's experiences, but only comment about mine. I can only ascertain that some are good and others bad. It's literally as straightforward as that, I imagine. Fast forward a few years and the good news is that my father settled down to become a great cattle rancher and can't even fathom how he stuck it out for so long behind a desk in a city office, because like me he adores the fresh air and the sunshine. And boy, he is a good rancher, even if I say so myself. He told me once that my great-uncle had actually appeared to him in a dream and said, Well done, son. I knew I could trust you to take care of my cows. My father said the dream seemed so real, and after that event his confidence in running the ranch literally skyrocketed. I've caught him on many occasions still having lengthy discussion with the cows over the oddities of life. As for the Bigfoot, I haven't actually seen him of late, but I know he's around. I can sense him. Recently I uncovered a few sixteen-inch tracks in the ground. Also at night I've often heard among the sounds of the crickets and frogs the occasional whooping sound, and my mother firmly believes it sounds like a primate. I shan't be telling her the truth, or how right she actually is. Sadly Abel did die about five years ago, but I'm so thankful he taught me how to become a fine rancher. So there you are. That's my story. Thank you so much for that incredible story. What a territorial Bigfoot if I ever saw one. Until next time, goodbye and good night. <laughs>